I, I want to talk about um, women in slave resistance around the idea presented by one of our first historians of women, Caribbean women history, Dr. Lucien Maturin. Lucien Maturin. She, some of you may know that um, women's history is a fairly new development. In the past, for instance, when I was in high school, I would not have studied about women in particular, and women would have been mentioned incidentally in, in history. But in the 1970s, uh, in response to what we call second wave feminism, women began to look at their own, not only women, but men too, historians began to look at women's role in history. And for the Caribbean, one person who led that examination was Lucille Maturin here, and she became a significant, she died recently, and she became a very significant person in terms of the women agenda, going to the UN on behalf of Jamaica and so on. So I want to use her book, um, The Rebel Woman, I'm not very good topic, but I it's published by the Institute, so you should be able to get copies here, as a kind of central um, idea running through what I have to present to you. And I'm, I suspect it's because of that book why the topic was also selected. Rebel Woman, the role of enslaved women in resistance. So if you have been doing Caribbean women's history, uh, women, Caribbean history generally, by now you would have recognized that rebellion was a feature of Caribbean slave society. Enslaved men and women um, from the very beginning of New World slavery asserted their, their rights to be. They presented themselves as more than chattels. Now in, in slave society, during slavery, the men and women who were brought from Africa were seen as commodities. And if you examine slave laws and slave regulations, you'll find that they were not presented generally as human beings. And so resistance or rebellion is a form of saying we are human beings. They asserted this by their reaction, and it is from the very outset. They attempted, according to Barbara Bush, who has written a whole book about women during slavery, they attempted to do this by to frustrate their owners couldn't free themselves at one go, but they would make sure that the lives of their owners were not very happy. Now, Lucille Matrin's book, as I just mentioned, was published in 1975. That decade, we began to develop Caribbean women's history. And you could use it as a kind of template. So in your studies, you could use Lucille Matrin's book as a kind of framework to look at um, how women resisted and their role. This is important because she sets women's resistance in the wider context of, of rebellion and the slave society. And she helped us to begin to examine the crucial and, and central role of women, not just in resistance, but in slavery. We also need to look, however, and she mentioned it under one of her subheadings, um, that they were not just resistors, they were not just rebelling. But in the literature, we'll find that there's a question asked for traitors. Did they collaborate with uh, white men, especially, against their brethren? And that's a question that you must grapple with. There may be doubts raised as you, you study this topic about their importance and resistance because they were supposedly so close to white men who admired them and who they developed relations with. And there's some evidence that, that they may have passed on information about rebellions to these men. But whether we agree that they were traitors or not, what we do know is that they took active part in resisting slavery. Women were considered troublesome, and they took a very anti-slavery stance. They shared some of the common things that men did. They're, they, but they are their own unique ways of challenging the system of slavery. What historians now refer to as gynecological resistance or petticoat rebellion. Right? So though they, were, they did some of the things that men did, because they were women, and because they had um, characteristics that were different from men, they could bring to resistance an added dimension. 
I want to also mention um, another historian who has spent quite a bit of time looking at women during slavery and has written a whole book on women as, rebel, uh, as rebels. His name is Hilary Beckles, Professor Hilary Beckles now, and he's now the principal of the, the Cable Campus of the University of the West Indies. And his book is called Natural Rebels. You don't have to write down the name because we'll get a sheet with that on it later on. Natural Rebels, a social history of enslaved black women in Barbados. Now, as in the title of his book tells you, they, he considered women as natural rebels. Why natural? For him, any response to enslavement, any resistance to enslavement was natural because slavery in itself was unnatural. It is not something that was um, who human beings would accept. So any response was a natural thing to do. And so his position is there was nothing exceptional or phenomenal about what women did. You can challenge the position. I personally feel that they did things that were exceptional and phenomenal because they were women and because of the context in which they operated and how women were viewed. Right? But I'll come back a little bit to that for women were viewed later. For Beckles, resistance was an important part of slave society. It was pervasive. It was endemic. It's, uh, by the end of the um, 17th century, re re resistance, rebellions were all over the area. Anywhere slavery was, in the Caribbean, in the Americas, there was resistance. And for him, um, the natural response, therefore, was to resist. We can't debate this pervasive nature of it. Once slave society became entrenched, once it, it expanded and the number of enslaved Africans increased, then you'd have more and more rebellion. The reason for this increased rebellion was the, 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 the profitability that could come from the new the crop, mainly sugar, in the Caribbean. It is said that if you're on a slave plantation, the conditions were harsh and much more harsh than you would find in other types of economic activities. And the, the, the desire for wealth and the obvious, um, the fact that profitability was obvious by the end of the century made that planters push their slaves more and more to get more and more profit, using the wheat more and more. And because of this, rebellions increased. So the worsening conditions on slave plantation, especially on sugar plantation, caused slave to rebel. And as the planters took shortcuts um, to increase their, their, their wealth. Rebellion also increased in those territories where success was more possible. In small territories like Barbados, and most on some of the Leeward Islands, it wasn't so possible for the slaves to, to be successful. They had nowhere to hide. Barbados, the land was almost fully used up. There was no hinterland like Jamaica with our mountain range where plantations didn't exist. It was still heavily forested, so they could go there if they ran away from the plantation. They could set up communities that and were isolated from the, from the um, plantation. In Guyana, this could have happened too because they had this swampy interland area. So you'll find that um, rebellion took place more frequently in islands like in an island like Jamaica and in a territory like Guyana compared to Barbados and the Leeward Islands. So where there was possibility of success, uh, rebellion were more frequent. Now, planters did not just um, sit back and didn't do anything. They, they tried in the initial.